Brother Charlie, whatever you are ready. There he is. Hey, good morning. Morning. First Corinthians First. ten. First Corinthians ten. Uh, we'll start at verse 1. We actually just want to focus on verse 13. But we'll start at verse 1 just to establish a context, okay? It said, Moreover, brethren, I would not uh, that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers uh, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Uh, but with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Okay, now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Okay, and then neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day uh, three and twenty thousand, that being uh, at the golden calf when they worshiped when Moses came down. Um, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Um, and that was uh, Numbers 14, if you recall, the brazen serpent. Yes. And then, okay, now all these things... Uh, happened unto them for examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And uh, he, here's kind of what we want to focus on is that there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able, above that ye are able, excuse me, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And then he goes on to you know, say, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, uh, my, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Okay, now, we've been looking at uh, simply uh, addictions and then recovery and how do you deal with it. So this week we, were, we are going to look at, according, at um, 10 principles uh, concerning how to deal with stubborn habits. In other words, how, how to get victory over stubborn habits. Uh, th these aren't original with me. These are actually uh, put forth my organization called Reformers Unanimous. And uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was Brother Stephen Currington or uh, Stephen Currington and his pastor Paul Kingsbury were the ones that came up with this. Uh, it, it's actually, it's all in the Bible, really, is what it is. It's just very common sense. but the wording of it and the way they structured it, uh, I, th I think was original to either him or the two of them together uh, combined when they were, when they were first um, uh, coming up with this. All right, as far as why we, we address this from scripture here is because uh, we see the establishment here when uh, Paul's writing to the church of Corinth that he would not have them to be ignorant concerning a number of things and that um, as he had addressed earlier in the book regarding fornication, regarding idolatry, regarding uh, the division that was going on with him, here he's, he's reiterating some of these things again. Uh, he doesn't want them to be idolaters. He doesn't want them to lust ever after evil things. And he goes on and gives them a right earth fire. It's the fact that the things that we have written in scripture are for our admonition. Uh, he goes, he'll later on say actually to the church at Rome that there are written so that we would have hope. 
um, as well, that we would have, an, the idea there is that we have an expectation, in other words, we have something to look forward to that we can cling to. Uh, but this is as well as warning that the things that happened to those in the past that we read about, even though they're far removed from us as far as culture, language, uh, time in history, and those things, the fact is they're still human, and we're still very capable of those same things. And so let us not follow their bad example, but rather let's do uh, opposite and follow the uh, good example and, and not go after those things that they did uh, so that we don't have to suffer the same type of uh, consequence and uh, experience the same type of uh, detrimental things that happened to them as a result of, of their going off into sin. And he gives a truth here in verse 13 that there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. Right? And here's a morning. Uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, focusing on verse 13. Okay, so he focuses here, or uh, excuse me, he says here that uh, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. Okay, so any temptation that you would experience is going to be on the appeal of what we're told in 1 John, either to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or to the pride of life. In other words, there's nothing that isn't uh, unique to human experience. Uh, you're not the first one to ever have experienced this. Uh, you're not going to be the last one to ever have experienced uh, this appeal to sin, uh, this temptation to go ahead and to want to go sin against Christ, uh, to, to indulge your flesh. It's not new to man, and it's, there, there isn't anybody else that isn't going to experience in some measure uh, temptation or an appeal to go ahead and sin against God. And so the temptation that's taking you, it's, it's common. Uh, everybody's going to deal with it at some point. Uh, he says, God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. He's not going to allow uh, temptation to be overwhelming to the degree that um, you won't be able to back away, turn around, flee it, or in any way basically deny it yeah. whatsoever. Um, and he says here, with regard to that, uh, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay, So there's no sin, regardless of how strong the appeal, regardless of how strong a power it would have had over you as an unbeliever, uh, regardless of how long you might have indulged it uh, in your flesh for the period of time that you would have lived, that you can't say no to now that you are born again. The reason being is that God here states that he very clearly has made an escape plan. He's made it a, a way of escape for you to be able to, you know, bear it. In other words, you, you can say no. You can flee from sin. You can have victory. Victory is possible. In fact, that's what God's desire and God's will is for you uh, in your life. And so uh, for a person that finds himself as a believer still in bondage, uh, you, you need to take... Uh, God at his word. You need to change your thinking with regard to uh, the sin that is appealing to you, that you're indulging in, and you need to take uh, to the uh, you need to take uh, the, the heart, the truths that God says about who you are now in, in Christ. Uh, he gives power and it's not just, okay, something to look forward to. Yes, we have a home in heaven. We have uh, you know, an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that faded not away. But you have power now to be able to live uh, in such a way that you don't have to give in uh, to those stubborn habits. You don't have to give in to that sin. You don't have to give in uh, to that appeal uh, when it comes calling to you. Uh, uh, First Corinthians, good morning. First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians 10. Okay. Um, I, I say this a little earlier. Okay. Um, a gentleman by the name of Steve Currington, uh, along with his pastor, uh, are you familiar with this? Okay. Yes. Um, with his pastor, Paul Kingsbury, uh, out in uh, Rockford, Illinois, uh, started an organization called Reformers Unanimous. Uh, it was actually started as a burden because of the fact that he himself, um, he had grown up in church and then he, he backslid for a number of years. He was involved in um, with narcotics and alcohol and that kind of thing. He was in bondage and he had a really bad car accident to where he almost lost his life. Uh, it, through the recovery process, as far as being able to get physically recovered, uh, he, he started 
going back to the church, and then he dedicated his life to Christ, um, and in the discipleship process as far as being able to get where, okay, now I can be functional. Uh, how do I get victory over these things? Uh, he, uh, these are just things that he discovered as far as, uh, again, they're not, they're not new. This, this is an original with me. I'm just taking their material and just presenting it because this is something that is helpful uh, for us, I believe, in being able to, to deal with somebody, either ourselves or also in being able to, when we counsel with somebody, uh, in how to have victory over, uh, they, they title it as having victory over stubborn habits, but basically how to have victory over sin. And th these are just 10 basic principles that you can find from scripture with regard to uh, having victory um, over sin. Uh, especially, uh, well, all sin's addictive, but they deal with that. The uh, first one is, if God's against it, so am I. If God's against it, so am I. I have to have a mentality. He uses Galatians 5, 19 through 24. Uh, so we'll turn there real quickly, Galatians 5. This would be the listing off of the works of the flesh. Um... You know, yeah, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, and beings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And then they that are, cruci are they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, and then let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay, so um, this is just a listing off if uh, Paul to the Church of Galatians basically addressing the fact that, hey, you are not made mature in Christ by operating in flesh of dependence or operating in, in, the, in the strength of your flesh but rather you, you do that by walking on uh, depending upon the spirit of God in other words yielded to the spirit of God and so since we have uh, been born again since we have received Christ as our savior uh, those of uh, for the believer you know then let us let us walk in other words let, let us uh, let us live in accord with that and that is that Christ is going to have not just preeminence but also he's going to be the one that's leading, directing, guiding and so I, I follow his lead not my own And so, because otherwise the thing is uh, when I'm leading and if it's in my flesh uh, this is the only product that comes out and you have that list there the, the adultery, fornication uncleanness, lasciviousness and the rest because that's the only thing flesh can produce. Whether it's safe flesh or unsafe flesh, flesh is flesh, period. And the fact is, when it has control, that's the only thing, it's, that's the only product it's capable of being able to pull forth. Uh, whereas the spirit, that's God's spirit, when he's leading, when he's reigning, this is the only, this is what, this is who he is by nature, that he's, uh, he's somebody that's, he's loving, he's joyful, he's peaceful, he's long-suffering, he's gentle, he's good, um, he's faith, but faithful, he's meek, uh, he's temperate, or is he self-control, he's self-discipline. Uh, and so the thing is, that's, that's what's going to be manifest from us if we are yielding, and he's the one that's in charge uh, if we're following his lead. And so the call is to, to follow his lead rather than let, let ourselves be the ones in charge of lead. Okay, so if God's against it, so am I. I have to have, um, go to First John 1, 9. We'll, we'll see, we're, we're going to probably constantly refer to this passage frequently here, but 1 John 1, 9. Okay, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, uh, This is a, a great and precious promise, great truth here. When we deal with sin, um, Okay, the idea here, confess. Confess is literally you're just admitting. It'd be as if you're in a court situation, in a court setting. You're standing before a judge. A uh, prosecutor has brought forth charges, and then the judge is going to address, is this true? Did this happen? 
at that point, what you have as a choice to say? That's either yes or no question. In other words, that's the only way you can answer it. Yes, this is true or no, this is not true. Okay? And so the fact is, uh, confession is literally, it's, it's um, you're, you're saying the same as, saying the same word as. It's literally what the, what the original language word would mean. But, so the idea is basically, it's an admission of the fact, yes, that's true. So uh, we'll use this as an illustration. Okay, God says this is, well, this is actually this purple. Let's say God says this is green, okay? And okay, this is green. I could sit here and argue as to whatever I would think this would be, but he says it's green. If I'm going to confess it, then I would say, yeah, that's green, all right? I know that seems kind of like silly or trite, but the fact is, the sin that I commit, okay, since that's 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 really what we're dealing with, okay, and not just me personally, but you, you all individually, your seats there, okay, the sin that you commit, when God calls it something, that's, I I I can either, yeah, that's that's what that is, or I can say no, you know, I, I can argue, I can try to defend it, I can try to justify it in any way, but the fact is, if I'm going to be right with God, uh, I'm to confess it. I say the same thing as what he says about it. Okay, so I have to adopt his mindset, mentality, and heartbeat towards what my sin is. That's sin. I call it out for what it is. Yeah, that's what that is. Okay, you're right. Okay, that's confession. Okay, and if we confess our sins, it says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Okay, so in other words, the account that now was upon me to pay for that, it's taken care of. Now, that's taken care of because of the blood of Christ, mind you. But the fact is, it's not held against me anymore. Because now I've freely admitted, okay, and then now I'm, um, it's, not, it's not held to my account. He says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all. Yes, sir. I just have a question. You just meant, you mentioned being in court. Confessing your sin, is it almost like a, a plea, a plea of guilty? Yeah. Basically, yeah. Because when you're called out uh, for sin, when you're in sin, the fact is you're, you're committing a crime against God. Uh, you're trespassing God's law. And so the fact is, Holy Spirit bring convincement, conviction. Hey, this is wrong. You've broken. You know, you, you've committed a crime against me. You've committed you know, a breach of the law at some point. And then... <laughs> You know, the, you can either excuse, you know, and try and justify yourself, uh, at which point you're going to grieve the spirit, you're going to quench the spirit. Um, you know, you might share your conscience along the process, do that long enough. Or you can just, you know, freely admit it. Hey, you're right, I'm guilty. You know, guilty as charged, this is what you say it is. And then you could, if, you know, you want to deal with it, you come, you come before God with it, Lord. Here's what I did, or here's what, here's what I did. Here's what I've done. You know, you call it out for what it is, as far as according to what God says on. It. Um, I'm sorry. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes sir. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And so, in with regard to the first principle, if God's against it, so am I. That's how I need to view my sin. Okay. I, that <laughs> for me to be able to get victory over it, I, I, you know, I need to address my sin from God's perspective. If he's against it, you know, I need to be as well. And I need to view it for what, for how he views it. I need to say, with regard to my sin, what God says about it. It's sin, it's wicked. It's transgression of his law uh, and calling out for what it is. Uh, second principle in dealing with stubborn habits. Well, the dealing with sin just getting victory over sin. I, I keep using that term just because that's where that's what they. Um, that, that's what their um, material uses. Okay. Um, every sin has its origin in our hearts. Every sin has its origin in our hearts. And then we all know this one in Jeremiah seventeen nine, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Okay. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The fact is, every imagination of our hearts. Though it may not be to the same degree as prior to the flood, where it was only evil continually, the fact is our heart, left to itself, 
uh, unless fettered or unless you know uh, constrained is going to it's you know we're we're, we're gonna we're, we're we're prone to sin uh, like the song said we're prone to sin prone to wander um, unless influence you know and then we exercise our will over it to and then put God's word in our hearts uh, so that you know um, we don't sin against him uh, the fact is we're left to ourselves we're you know we're gonna self-destruct we're gonna destroy and the sin that we commit finds its origin uh, James puts it like this that um, in James 1 uh, yet let no man say that uh, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then lust, when, when it hath conceived, bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it, it is finished, bringeth you know, forth death. You know, do not err, my beloved brethren. So the fact is, it's, it's from within us that our sin comes. Yes, the devil's real, and I'm not trying to discount any of that. And I'm trying to scout also the influence of the world. But the fact is, all, most of our problems come from within us because we let our flesh just run rampant and not have any kind of uh, strictures uh, within our life as far as for our heart, or have any, uh, or we don't try and um, put positive influence or any sufficient positive influence in our life with regard to the Word of God and godly influence so that we would have our hearts uh, and our flesh reined in. Okay, so every sin has its origin in our hearts. Principle three, it is easier to keep the heart clean than it is to clean it after it has been defiled. Okay. Uh, Proverbs 22.3, Proverbs 22.3. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Okay, it is easier to keep the heart clean than it is to clean it after it has been defiled. Um, with regard to that, we do have grace, we do have mercy from the Lord. Uh, we do have, if we find ourselves in a position where we sin, uh, we can repent. And we can turn to Him. We confess our sins again. First John one nine, He is faithful to, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But God's desire is that we would avoid sin altogether. Uh, we don't fall into it. He's made provision for us to be able to go ahead and live a life where we would sin less. Does this make sense? In other words, where <laughs> where we we don't sin as often or quite as often. We can actually live a life where we sin very minimally altogether. Uh, where we don't have we don't have to because the provision is there for us to be able to avoid it altogether. Yes, we still have the sinful flesh. We'll have that till the day either he returns and we're taken, or we you know we pass on uh, you know through death from this life. Um, uh, but the fact is, God's made provision for us to be able to have continual victory, so that we don't have to give in and we don't have to have either short period or long period of uh, where where sin is. And so once you have uh, defilement from sin. Yes, we can't have cleansing. God's made that uh, provision available for us. Uh, we can't have a victory over it again. Uh, the fact is there are, we'll see this a little bit later, there are repercussions. Uh, because we don't live unto ourselves, we, uh, obviously we don't die unto ourselves. Uh, we have uh, long-reaching effects on other people's lives. And there are there's, uh, a lot of times irreparable damages that happen when we sin uh, that affect other people in a very negative manner. And so uh, we, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, as the saying goes, is when you, when you let, you know, words fly out of your mouth, it's kind of hard to kind of take them back, you know. Um, you, you just want to avoid altogether if you can. Uh, again, God's made provision for that. Uh, and so the a deterrent to want to go ahead and sin would be the fact that it's easier to keep your heart clean 
uh, then they have to deal with all the repercussions after of trying to make things right because you haven't. Um, principle four. Okay, it's not possible to fight a fleshly appetite by indulging in it. It's not possible to fight a fleshly appetite by indulging in it. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5. Ecclesiastes 5. Uh, he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, uh, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. Uh, this is also vanity. And you put uh, James 1 with regard to um, where we had read a little earlier that uh, lust, when I conceive, bringeth forth sin, and then sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. When you are indulging in it, you're not going to have Obviously, you're you're entrapped in it. You're entangled in it. You're not going to have ability to be able to go ahead and turn away at that point. Uh, you can stop, and it is possible, obviously, to get forgiveness. But the fact is, you're not going to have victory over something if you're indulging in it. Uh, if you are giving into it, uh, it's going to be ruler over you. Uh, go to Romans six, actually. Romans Before you. Before you go there, which what was the verse you uh, quoted again on that last one? Ecclesiastes 5.10. Five, which is, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that love, loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Uh, it's the same idea as in Proverbs, where we're told that there's three things that are not satisfied. A4. Uh, you got the, the barren womb. Oh, right. In um, Proverbs 30, right? Yes. In other words, there's hell is uh, something also that not, you know you indulge a desire and it's not going to be enough it's not going to be sufficient there's not going to be a point in time where it says okay oh, I'm good I'm satisfied okay sin is like <laughs> you know it takes you further than what you want to go and you, you're going to pay more than what you want to pay and so the if you're indulging in it you know you're not going to want to stop is the thing it's not until afterwards uh, actually you know go wow uh, Go to, uh, you see that actually, I think it's in Proverbs 23, about the drunken man. Uh, where it talks about, um, you know, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Okay, thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as that, as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. And here's his response. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Okay, <laughs> it's got very negative effects on your life, and you still want to go ahead and pursue that. Okay, same as with alcohol. That sin has the same same effect and measure. Oh, I, that's right. I told you Romans six. <laughs> There's a reason why I mentioned about Romans six. Verse 16. Okay, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? And, you know, and then and then he goes and tells them the truth here. Is it? But, but God, God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which delivered, uh, which was delivered you. And then you know, being being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Um, don't live in light of your old. And this is with regard to fighting, uh, fighting a fleshly appetite if you're indulging in it. The fact is, you, if you are indulging in it, you're indulging in your sin. The fact is you're yielding yourself as a servant 
to sin, and you're living in light of your old nature rather than what your new nature is. And so God, God's admonition is, don't live, in, don't live like that. You're no longer a slave. I've freed you. You don't have to serve sin. Um, serve God instead. You know, He's the one that you know died for your sin. He rose again from the dead. He's giving you new life. He's freed you from that bondage, so you don't have to live like that. Now, uh, reckon that to be the case uh, is how you're going to get victory, because he addresses that as far as earlier, that you reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God uh, through Christ Jesus. And so the thing is, uh, if you're not reckoning that, the fact is you need to start. Uh, the fact, if you're a believer, then the sin that you commit, uh, that's a woeful choice. And you didn't have to do that. Uh, it's because you're not yielding yourself, in it, and also you're not reckoning yourself to be really dead to it. It's no longer your master, so you don't have to obey it. Okay. Um, next principle, principle five. Small compromises lead to great disasters, or otherwise known as little sins lead to big sins. Little sins lead to big sins. And he has here Luke 16.10 and then also Matthew 6.24. Uh, Luke 16.10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. And then Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot uh, serve God and mammon. I'm not sure why he would have put What chapter was that? Uh, six. Uh, six. Yeah. And then verse 24. That, that was of Matthew. Okay, small compromises lead to great disasters. Honestly, what I think of this with regard to is in when we read in First Kings. Also, you can read about it in First Chronicles when Jehoshaphat uh, compromised with the King of Israel that he said he would go to battle with him, and <laughs> it was strange that he would allow himself to be put in that position. I could see, to some degree, as far as his heart to want to see Israel unified as a whole. Uh, the ten with the twelve, or with, excuse me, the ten with the two, uh, again. Um, but his request, uh, Ahab's request with regard to uh, Jehoshaphat, that he would go out as in his in his in his dress. In other words, so he was supposed to pretend himself to be King Ahab, knowing that I don't know. To me, it would seem like common sense that if you are as a king. You know, then you would make yourself basically a big target. You're going to be a big target. And that's, for the most part, really what happened. They saw, uh, the enemy saw him as, oh, this is uh, uh, the king of Israel, so let's go after him. And then he realized, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> they're chasing me to kill me. So he cries out to God, and then God basically reveals, hey, this isn't King, of, uh, this isn't, uh, king Ahab. And King Ahab was the one that was disguised, actually, he was basically as a peasant. And, you had somebody just randomly shoot an arrow uh, from out of a distance, hits him between the chest, and then boom, you know, he sinks into his chariot. Um, he could have had a, he could have been he could have been destroyed, he could have been killed, um, just for why well, wouldn't call it silly necessarily, but just for something really foolish, really dumb. Um, it's, uh, and it's the same thing with any other uh, sin. Small compromises are going to lead to great disasters. It's the small things or the little things that we are not careful about in our lives that eventually are going to lead to big ruin down the road. 
And so what you want to address that you want to be meticulous about is just watching that your small, quote unquote, sins, your, you know, your small indiscretions, whatever term you want to use. The fact is, yes. No, 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 for the short you're saying. Uh, all sin that you would commit, it's a big deal to God. You know, Christ died for all of it. And so it, whatever you committed, whether it be, you know, a little white line, quote unquote, or, you know, murdering somebody, the fact is it all put Christ on the cross. And so it's all a big deal to God. And so it's not, you know, something to take lightly. Yes? Uh, it reminds me of what uh, one of the great preachers of yesterday said when when he said, sin will not ravage your house if you kick it off your doorstep. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's really good. I believe it was M.R. Dahan, but it might be, but there might be others who probably used it, I'm sure. Next principle, principle six. Oh, we could be able to get through this. Okay. Those who do not love the Lord will not help us serve the Lord. Okay, so those who do not love the Lord will not help us serve the Lord. Um go well, okay, he he put down John five, eighteen through twenty, but I would say go to first Corinthians uh, six. Go to first Corinthians six. Actually, it's in verse 5, or chapter 5, just a page over, uh, chapter 5, starting at verse 9. It says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, um, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Okay, but now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetousness, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. Okay, now here's the idea behind that. He's addressing them with regard to an issue, and that is they need to separate. Um, Christ said that we're supposed to be in the world, but not of it. Okay, so we're not to be overtaken by its sins, uh, and we have power and ability to be able to reject the sinful influence upon us, right? Uh, but we're here to be salt and light, okay? We're, we're supposed to be a challenge to the darkness. Uh, in Ephesians, we're supposed to reprove it, you know? We're supposed to, we're not even supposed to be speaking those things, which, which they do in darkness. Um, but the fact is, we, we're, we're here to be able to glorify God and to reach those that don't know Him. Um, so if you, if you don't interact and you withdraw altogether, then you're not going to be able to do that. You're not going to be effective at doing that. Uh, but here's the thing. He says, okay, you withdraw yourself from somebody that's called a brother, and they part into, or they're actively indulging in these things. Here's the reason why. Yes, sir? I was just thinking, when I, I, I used to have an RD chapter, and one of the things that I advise people against is to go to a psychologist. You're using the world's methods to reform from sin, not the Bible. Even Christian psychologists. That's a good point. <laughs> That's a good point. They have, um, I haven't studied a whole lot with regard to psychology, but I do know this, that they have an approach that's different, that they, they view it as, it's humanistic, basically. It's not, it's not, it has nothing to do with God altogether. Um, I guess Christian psychology, what they do is they take that and they just add maybe some scripture to that. But by and large, I know most of their, approach to things leave God out of the picture altogether whereas with scripture altogether it's just uh, safest thing you know God gives you truth uh, if we believe it and then we seek to adhere yield ourselves to that we're going to see God work in miraculous ways in our life uh, with regard to the those, those it's separating here those who do not love the Lord will not help us serve the Lord uh, evil, corrupt, evil communication corrupt good manners. The fact is, the influence that they would have the brethren, um, by and large, it will take us down rather than us bringing us out or us bringing them up. 
there has to be a separation there, and it's as much for our safety as it as it is for their betterment. Um, The brother that is bound in sin will not be helped by me coming alongside and participating with them. Does it make sense? And their influence on us is going to drag us down. Uh, they need somebody, in a sense, basically, to be in their face about it. Hey, you need to get it right. Uh, they need, you know, well, obviously we do it in love, but the fact is, they they need that. They need that harshness because the fact is it. Um, I think of it like, I know this seems unrelated, but I think of it like this. Um, <laughs> and I'm not against missions or anything like that, okay? But a lot of times with, um, we'll, we'll, you see this a lot in foreign missions, okay? Where you have individuals coming from a third world country uh, want to come over to America because, you know, this is land of opportunity and land of abundance. And so you have you think, oh, you know, money grows on trees and, you know, there's gold everywhere to be found, kind of thing. And, the, you know, it's the same God that we serve here or there, right? He's just as powerful and just as capable of being able to provide for them there as he is for us here. And so the thing is, you cripple them because, in a sense, here coming to America because they look to depend on human resources rather than the God who created all those things. Does make sense? And so what you want is you want somebody to be able to stand on their own and that comes from them actively seeking God, waiting on God, trusting God uh, by faith to actively work in their situation where they're at. They won't learn that if you just come alongside, um, you know, hey pal. Again, that's not... Um, it's not to say that you don't pray for them, you don't love them, uh, but the fact is, if you're alongside with them, they're not going to see that difference, they're not going to be challenged, they're not going to have that shame that God designed in uh, in this for that to be the case, for them to want to draw out and to say, hey, look, I can't do this anymore, and then have victory around their own two feet. So, uh, you know, by God's conviction. You're out of time, mister. Yes, sir, you're right. Okay, so the last principle was uh, six. We got four more left to go. Uh, those who do not love the word will not help us serve the word. We'll be finishing the last four next week, and then we'll be looking at some other material with regard to that. Anybody have any questions? All right. Get this message. Yeah. <laughs> Taking a stand? That's right, I'm taking a stand. <laughs> I got pulled that one last week. Did you really? <laughs>